Hi, I'm Big Carol. I'm going to talk about modern home automation. And you don't need to have a modern home for this. This is like Good. where automation was in like the 80s and where it is now. And I mean, how does that modern that much? But, uh, but the kind of tools that you use do. Uh, I should turn my mic on this side. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, that's pretty loud. No, it's all right. It's, it's okay. hard. It's cool. Awesome. Cool. You just have a lot of data sets. I'll be loud then. Um, <laughs> My name is Ben Caro. Uh, I'm a hardcore hacker, kind of a general geek by trade. Um, my day job is that I'm a computer engineer at Mozilla, so I spend most of my time doing with computers, and that's really great, but it's not that rewarding it's in, in the way that like doing something tangible is. Uh, and so home automation kind of gives me the satisfaction of being able to do something and actually see the results as opposed to some disk changing on the screen. Um, so I do stuff for the dinosaur here. I also do weird stuff like this. Um, this is a wearable computer that I made. This is actually a little Pokemon bag. Um, I wrote most of this. It's a tweet at the bottom that says, it's a computer. <laughs> what I say about a lot of things. Um, yeah, so. You have your own parody account, do you arrive? I do. I, 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 I have a parody account that's called Shippy Hero Sense. Um, my name is B. Hero on Twitter and IRC and email and everything. Um, so, yeah, you don't need to look at that account. <laughs> um, so, just really quick, um, starting off with the definition of home automation. And I, I struggled a really long time to try to find something that would describe this without actually using the words like household and automation. And it's more like. Uh, things that you can make automatic without you thinking about it, some way to make your life easier, and that's what I was kind of going for with this. Hi. Uh, oh, many people, wow. Hi, guys. Oh, okay. Just got in the beginning. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 more seats. I do the back row. Seats. Oh, there's more seats over here. <laughs> so, in the 90s, they tried to hire and bring in all this stuff. They called it robotics, which is kind of, I don't know, it's like domestic robotics, and they tried to make portmanteau of that, except everyone thought that was really cheesy, and that's why you never hear that anymore. It sounds like demonics. Or dynamics. It's got a lot of hunger in your home. That's a good thing. I'm not going to answer that. Uh, so you're asking, why would I want it? And so I asked myself this really too, but I, I kind of had this vision. And it starts off with uh, me in a typical day at work in my typical office. And I get really tired just from doing all this work. <laughs> and so afterwards, what I want to do after a really tiring day is I take my little bike ride home, it's grueling, it's both ways uphill, and it's just terrible. Um, I open my garage door, throw my bike in the garage, and kind of shuffle upstairs because I'm really tired. And so what I want to do is just sit in front of a fireplace, and I want it to be really calm. I want to have like some sounds of rain on my window and be relaxed by that. And really, I want to just listen to some jazz and chill out and have a really relaxing evening because after a day at work, that's exactly what I want. But I don't want to have to go through all of this other stuff. I also kind of want a robot to pour me a glass of brandy that's just to get in the mood of you. <laughs> realize this might be a bit far fetched. But I mean, this is like, just imagine this, and you can just imagine being able to have this without having to go through all this rigmarole of like pouring a glass of brandy out in the morning so you can grab it in the evening, and stuff like that. Uh, but there's actually some useful things that you could do if you're not feeling as slovenly as I am. Like, for instance, you might lock yourself out. And if you don't have a key, if you don't have a lockbox outside, if you don't have roommates, then you're kind of screwed. And so this is something that if you have your phone on you or something else, it can kind of save you from yourself, which I really need sometimes. Um, you can also do things like uh, automate your garden. So if you, uh, if you accidentally forget to water your plants and you just got to work, you don't have to bike all the way home again to go water your plants and then head back again. Um, and this is really useful for me because sometimes I'm a little spacey. Uh, you can also have a Roomba. A lot of people have these things. Not many of them like to roll around in cat poop, but uh, I mean, they, they, can, <laughs> they can clean up your, your carpet for you. And this is like a little nice piece of home automation if you don't want to get into anything else. Have you guys all heard of Roombas before? Cool. Um, 
You can also do things like monitor a dog door or something because sometimes, I don't know, a raccoon could sneak in or something else. And speaking of raccoons, you can have chickens, and raccoons are like the natural enemy of chickens. So if you can do things like monitor your chicken coop with either a camera or a sensor on the door, you can go out, you can know when to run outside with a baseball bat and try to chase that raccoon away. These are these are problems real people have. Um, and so this all kind of started back in 1968 with this, uh, do you guys remember like the old futuristic kind of uh, home television shows which they had computers and they helped you out in, in kind of crazy ways and then they, like, this was called 1999 AD and it was like, what they did in 1999 was like in the 60s and it was perfect and your wife was obviously very happy at home making dinner for everything she could use the computer for things like Cooking more, uh, deciding what to cook. No cow beer at the bottom. And even little Johnny got in on it, and uh, he gets the results of this test. And you can find this video on the Internet Archive. You can get it on YouTube, and you're gonna have to go. Watch it yourself if you want to find out if you need pass or fail the test. But obviously this is 1999, so it included a lot of little buttons and yeah. switches here. That, who knows what they did? I think some of those. Randomly the guys. You didn't even get the benefit of the full alphabet on the keyboard there. You know? Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it seems that we should just label X, Y. <laughs> obviously they only need two letters in the future. <laughs> yeah. So in the beginning, there were things like this. Um, you wanted coffee in the morning, and you pushed some buttons on it, and it had a time, so if you woke up at like, if you had to be at work at 9, you woke up at 7.15, it took you 15 minutes to get your clothes on, so when you get downstairs, your coffee's ready, and you can drink it, and that makes everyone happy, and really, why would you need any more home automation than this? But then some people got other ideas, like sometimes you want to like give your fish some sunlight, so they need these little uh, timers for aquariums so you can turn on and off the socket, things like that. And this was modern home automation for like 30 years until, until someone actually decided they wanted something more out of this. They wanted to go back and actually get little Johnny's computer and they wanted to get recommendations for luncheons. Um, <laughs> and so, they made this thing called X10, um, and it was an Italian project, there were, there were some Italian boffins there, and they wanted to, they, they figured out that, um, I'll show it in the next slide about how they did it, um, it was originally made in Italy, and it was called X10 because they had 10 iterations to be able to get this darn thing to work. They knew it was theoretically possible, but it took them 10 tries from scratch to be able to do it. Um, and it, it operates a little bit like this. This is what power looks like coming from any of the outlets in here. It's, it's called two-phase, and the blue part is the uh, one-phase, and I don't know if this is right because I'm really colorblind, but this is the other phase, um, and that's the ground in the middle. And where they meet here, they figured out that they could push a bit through it. Only one bit, but they could do it. At least 1978, a bit was a lot of data. Um, <laughs> And so that worked, and they were able to do it. So they were able to send information over the power lines. It was really cool. Um, and so you get some things like this. Uh, and the way it worked was you had 4-bit house code. It was labeled H or P, and you had 4-bit unit code. So your house would be H or P, and that means, because it's only 4-bits, that means you can only have 16 devices in your house, which I guess for a lot of people for a very long time was enough. And the way you actually changed this was you stuck a little screwdriver here, and you turned it to the correct position. <laughs> And what the scary thing is, is yeah, this is X10, and it really hasn't changed since 1978 very much. It's in a new modern white case like this because the beige ones went out of style, but it's still the same turning thing, and there's still no ground on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it had four-bit instructions. You can only do really basic things, like you can turn everything on or off, and you can turn all the lights on or off, and then you can toggle a single thing. That's all you can do. When it first came out, there was no way to receive a verification from it, so you just kind of fired commands at it and hope it got there. Uh, the problem with this is that, uh, ah, yeah, um, the problem with it is that it's just not very reliable, which I'll get to in a second. And the way you did this, because in the 70s, why would you even want a computer? No one realized they would want a computer in the house. So they had a thing like this, and it sat on like your, 
your command and control center is probably the husband's desk in the in the den somewhere. But <laughs> you press buttons and you can kind of control your whole house from from this little controller, which was all you needed, pretty much. Uh, this had some problems, though. It was unreliable. It only worked like 70 or 80 percent of the time, and each time, it, like because it was only one bit at a time, it was really slow. Uh, it took like 700. It took three quarters of a second just to get there. And if you want to like receive a verification back, you have the same 70 to 80 percent on reliability. Sometimes it takes three or four seconds to just do a single thing. Um, and because you had a limited number of units, this means that you could do a whole lot, and that's why it didn't really catch on with a lot of people. The other problem was this: all of this was going on before we had transformers in the power line, and we were stepping down from 480, 480 in the power line to 120 in the house. So the house code really was your house code. So if your neighbor and you were both on house code A, you could flip his lights on and off. <laughs> Which sounds a little bit scary, but some people wired their door locks to this, and so they could open and close door locks as well. So this didn't catch on for that reason, too. Um, Garage doors and phones. But no, this is all uh, over the wire, though. So this isn't wireless at all. But yeah, you can... Garage doors are like four digit codes. Yeah. So you just are going to iterate at that time. Yeah. A thousand times, and then, or 10,000 times, and then you'll be good. Yeah, I couldn't get it to work uh, through the different uh, breakers uh, to get past that. So if things were wired differently, I'd have it plugged in here, and it could turn the lights on in here, but it couldn't then. Yeah, yeah. So if, like, if, your, if your house runs on like one side of the house runs on one phase, one side runs on the other phase, they just can't talk at all. The only way to really you know you can do it is to try it, in which case you spend a bunch of money, and if it doesn't work, then, uh, then you throw it up on eBay. The cheapest place to get all this X-Ten stuff on eBay is on eBay. And so this is literally, <coughs> I looked for X-10 lot on eBay yesterday, and I pulled up a picture, and this is it. All of this beauty can be yours for exactly $19.99. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> some of the stuff might be cool. I mean, there's like old cable TV stuff yeah. in here as well, and I don't know if you actually want to use this stuff instead of like a computer, but you get all of these little output control things too. That's kind of cool. There's knobs to turn. Yeah. So if you don't want to like invest a bunch of money into it, but you still want to kind of play with this stuff, then it's cheap. It's on eBay. If, if it doesn't work for you, darn, put it back on eBay again for as much as you can work. <laughs> Yep. Um, and that's pretty much all that I wanted to talk about with X10. Um, and then after that, there wasn't really a lot of demand for it. It didn't really go anywhere. Um, there were some clones, like uh, Europe got kind of jealous because they operated it on three-phase, and the original Italian inventors who created it couldn't really run it on three-phase. So they got a little jealous over that, and they made this thing called the European Housing Standard in which it was kind of like X10, but worked a little differently, and eventually that turned into KNX. It got rolled into that, and KNX was like this big standard, so this building's probably wired with KNX. It was supposed to be this big industrial thing that was scary, and it was supposed to be all things to all people. It could run over internet, it could run over Wi-Fi, it could run over like power line, it could run over everything. And as a result, you couldn't <coughs> really guarantee that if you got one thing that said KNX, it would work with another thing that said KNX. And so it was really complicated, so not any, basically nobody did this stuff at home. Um, it was also expensive, so like even nowadays, if you want to try to find it, you have to like go to CDW or some enterprise like uh, distributor, and then you have to like get a PDF catalog and find the number that corresponds with the thing you want to buy, and then you send in, I don't know, a check, and then you get a box three weeks <laughs> later. Just like, yeah, really old-fashioned stuff. And so it's big and scary, no one ever wanted to do this, so that's as much as I need to talk about KNX. Um, one of the more modern-ish things, when I say modern-ish, I mean like 2003, 2004, and that's the most modern things that come out like this, um, is called Insteon. Um, it came out with a single Windows program, and if you wanted to run that, it worked pretty well. Uh, it does the, the power line stuff like X10, and it's actually backwards compatible with X10 too, which is kind of cool. Um, and it also does some wireless and it'll do bridging and mesh networking, and it's pretty good about range. It's also moderately expensive. When you compare everything to this old X10 stuff on eBay, it's going to be really expensive comparatively. Um, so, like, uh, outlets or something like that will be like $30 instead of X10, which is a lot for over 20 
Um, so that's Insteon. Uh, the other one that's worth mentioning these days is Z-Wave. Um, it was made by GE, and it's this, big, it's this consortium of about 30 companies that make this stuff. And it's like hardware vendors, and software vendors, and like installation with people, like big construction companies. And it's wireless only. Uh, it's an open standard. It's based on Zigbee, which is this really common uh, radio platform that like RC people use and like uh, radio operators use as well. And so it's it's standard and the hardware is cheap and uh, it's really known well how it works. And so this is kind of what I chose based on like software available and my familiarity with all of this stuff. Um, and there's also some commercial solutions. So this one is called Nest. Um, if you're curious about home automation, you kind of you probably came to this talk expecting to hear about stuff like Nest. Um, and it is home automation, but they will never say home automation on their site because it's kind of a dirty phrase. So they'll say something like smart home or learns with you or something like that. <laughs> or tracks you all the time. <laughs> So what you do is you're supposed to teach it. So like you plug it in where your thermostat was, and this entire body is a knob here. So you kind of turn it, and uh, it, it keeps track of every time you do that. So it kind of learns when you're away and when you're there. It's got some motion sensors in it, so even if you don't do that, it still kind of knows. Um, and it's pretty good. A lot of people like these. The problem is, is that you're kind of expensive. You need one for each part of your house that you want to control. And they're two hundred, yeah, they're two hundred and sixty bucks. Um, and if you just want something like really concise and uh, integrated, then you can do this, and it works. And uh, there's a gentleman here at Osprey that's going to talk about it by the name of Lars. And this is the pellet stove in uh, Mr. Lon's yurt. Uh, he uses the Nest to control his pellet stove whenever he wants to heat it or cool it, and it works really well. And he's giving a talk about that, I think, later today. Do you talk about it already? I hope not. Okay, cool. Um, tomorrow? tomorrow? Okay. It might be tomorrow. It keeps changing. <laughs> tomorrow, 11 a.m. Okay, so if you're interested in hearing about that, then he will definitely be there to talk to you about it. Um, and he's really excitable and he's a very fun guy. He's a good speaker. Um, so if you're interested, go do that. Uh, there's also one more, yeah. Uh, so, sorry about that. The things with Ness is it watches your usage. It uh, automatically adjusts to your lifestyle, so if you're there or not, and they say they can save you 50% of your electricity cost every month. I think that's a little optimistic, but I mean, maybe it is, maybe it doesn't. It'll also give you some really pretty graphs. So if you want to see like your power usage and your heating usage over time, you can log into their website and log in with the account you have to create when you buy the device, and then you can go look at the graphs. Um, and then just yesterday, they announced they released this shiny new API, so if you want to use that information and throw it into this website called If Then That, or you want to add it to Google Drive and keep track of it that way, then you can go do that. Um, and so it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, I don't have one simply because it's, I'm hard pressed to drop 260 bucks on that, but I recognize that some people do and it, it really works for them, and I want to hear if it works really well or not. Uh, there's one more, um, and this is kind of, it's called Philips Hue, and they made a really big deal out of this, and so we made intelligent light bulbs. And, I mean, they kind of did. Uh, so this is a little wireless base station that connects to your Wi-Fi network, and then you use your little Android phone or iPhone, and you can control the lights. And these are just little LED light bulbs, and they've got some tricks, like you can get a bunch of them and then add them to a group as a room or something like that, and then you can change the color to red, and you can do some color scheme stuff with it, which is kind of cool. But it doesn't support more than lights, and it's pretty expensive. This is 200 bucks for three light bulbs. It's two cents long. Wow. Yep. your opinion. Why does it have five? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to control your light bulbs. It's a great yeah. party room. <laughs> That's it. You really want to green lights. <laughs> so you don't have to get up. Yeah, you want green lights, you can change the color. Quite a bit. The color, oh, yeah. The color is probably Yep. And so these were pretty good, but like all this stuff before and all this stuff there, it was all right. Um, and so with Hue, it's got a simple API that you can control with it, but you can't do it if you're not at home. 
which is a problem, but I guess that's not what they're going for. And you can control it through a mobile interface. If you want to do it through a computer, it's going to be you're going to have not as great of an experience doing it. Because you have a bunch of uh, No, it's not credible. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit weird. <laughs> they do like port knocking and things like that. It's kind of sketchy. Um, <laughs> But the API is really cool where you can pass the port knocking weirdness. <laughs> you can library and everything is hunky dory. Um, so that's Q. Uh, and this is all kind of annoying and really last decades. So, what some friends of mine and me did at Mozilla is we wanted to do this thing called the ambient web. Um, and we didn't want it to have anything to do with hardware, so it's going to be hardware agnostic. You can do it on any little microcontroller you can get your hands on. And you basically go to our website, download an image, and then put it on an SD card or get it in your little device somehow, and then it will automatically connect to the network and then register to the server. And then you can just go there and then see all of your registered devices, and then you can control the, <coughs> the web interface instead of having to fiddle with hardware manually and caring what kind of hardware it is and things like that because we're beyond the point of caring anymore. Um, and so it's an all JavaScript interface. Uh, it's, it's kind of a side project that some of us are doing at, uh, at Mozilla. And we're doing a PSU Castle project with a couple students this year. So hopefully we can get something out pretty soon and you'll hear about, you'll hear more about this. The project name might change from ambient web. We're not sure yet. But uh, this is a long-term solution and we have a proof of concept right now, but it's nowhere near, near usable yet. But this is kind of the direction I'd like to go. <coughs> um, so my setup, this is kind of the stuff that, uh, that I did uh, when I wanted to kind of experiment with this stuff. Uh, I used the Z-Wave one, um, and I just got a couple things. Uh, it's all available on Amazon or eBay, or uh, Fry's even has some stuff too, if you want to go down there. Um, you just have a little USB wireless sender and receiver, um, and you can see that hanging out of my laptop, which is this little stick right there. To associate your to pair devices with it, you just press the button and press the button on the device, and they're paired together. It's pretty easy that way. Um, and I got a couple of devices. So I got a little uh, little door window sensor um, because I wanted to see if the door was open. Uh, and my roommate had a great idea because I didn't know what door I wanted to put on. Put it on the liquor cabinet. Let's, let's make some statistics to see exactly when the liquor cabinet is open. Um, <laughs> because I really wanted my fireplace, I put the on-off switch on the fireplace so I could put the fireplace on so I hot coffee every morning. Um, <laughs> And switch power out then which I'm assuming is going to be useful. I'm just having a brain part with creativity for exactly what I'm going to do with that. Maybe a blender or something. Oh, that would be great. I'll put like, a motion sensor next to it with a cat gets close and then turn the blender on. There's already been done, and they're some of the funniest gifts I've ever seen. <laughs> So we're going to have a YouTube party at the top, right? <laughs> um, so I got some pictures of what they look like. That's the stick hanging out, of, out of, hanging out of my laptop. You can't see it. I apologize for the thumb pictures, but you're going to see a couple more, so I apologize for those. Um, it looks like that. It's a little USB device. Um, this is the door window sensor thing. So this is like the body of it that you stick somewhere stationary, and there's a little magnet in here that, makes a, that contacts a switch in here. And when it's contacted, it's off. And when you kind of pull them apart, uh, it turns it on. Um, and so you can, you can see how you can attach it to a window or a door or something. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as they're pulled apart. How big is a penny on that picture? What scale? How big is it? Uh, well, there's one hanging on the door right now, so I'll look at it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I got a little demo later, and I was going to have someone open and close the door for it. Um, and this is the wall switch that I got in my bag that uh, I can pass it, well, no, it's on ground. <laughs> I can pass it around if people care, but it's a little button switch. Uh, it's, it got, it's exactly like a little box that a switch usually is, so it's really easy to just um, like unplug the old one and <clears throat> screw it into the exact same place it is, and suddenly it's wireless too. Um, and this is the outlet, uh, and this works. I, uh, I, I kind of rigged it up a little bit by just chopping the end off like a PC power cable and sticking it on there, and it totally works. It's all insulated. 
It's only 120. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It works. The problem is that only one output is switched and the other one's probably gone, sadly. Um, and so yeah, this is my liquor cabinet with my proof of concept going on it. And so this is the opposition, and what I really want to know is when this happens, when someone's in there stealing the booze. Um, and the cool thing is with the piece of software I'm using, I can actually graph this stuff, and so I can like see trends, or like I can make triggers on it, so I can like send myself an alert or a text message or something when it happens. Ah, good point. It's like spin the blender up a little bit is kind of a hint. For my reasons. Probably a five minute timer to yourself. Exactly. Me and some friends are building a uh, uh, a drink bot to actually mix drinks. So theoretically, you could hook it up to the home automation. There's a whole company that does yeah. that called Party Robotics. Oh really? <laughs> do they do home automation too? One of my friends is this company and it is a drink machine. It is like it makes you drinks. So. Cool. Yeah. Have you heard of people doing the opposite, like people who are kind of quit drinking while? Eating? There's a gentleman by the name of Paul actually gave a talk here yesterday. Uh, it should be online pretty soon about uh, about keeping track of like things you're trying to do with your life and uh, um, ways to be able to graph that and to kind of reward yourself when you do things you know you should be doing. So like. He knew that he was supposed to floss every night, and so he would reward himself if he flossed like five nights in a row, and he had some ways of doing automation to be able to do that for himself. Um, yeah? Can I just clarify that you make sure this connects to that black thing in your computer? Yep. And then the computer makes the network request to serve Red Mozilla and stores all this? Is that what's happening? No, no. That was like pie in the sky okay. and maybe next time greens. So, so if you take your computer out of your house, please don't worry. Yeah, so um, it needs to have a computer with this little stick running somewhere. So um, can you have that on a desktop or your house and then like SSH into that thing and start controlling your house? Yeah, you can yeah, probably yeah, use yeah. a Raspberry Pi or one of these. Exactly, right. Right. exactly. Yeah. the piece of software I'm going to demo actually comes with an image for a Raspberry Pi already. So you can just write it to a little SD card, and plug it in and turn it on. It's got a little web interface that you can log into and do all the stuff. You don't need to actually build systems or anything like that. Um, so the software, there's a lot of immature software out there, and it looks pretty scary. Like there was one back when it was really, really popular that cost something like Mr. Coffee or Mr. Something. They called it Mr. House, and it's <laughs> easy old graphics from then too. It's like a picture of a house with a face on it. Um, and uh, yeah, even like the really mature stuff is really outdated by this point. Um, so long term is write our own, do the, the ambient web stuff. And the short term is this project I call, uh, out of the Netherlands, called Domotiga. And uh, that's the piece of software that has the Raspberry Pi thing on it, and it's compatible with a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and it's got really good comprehensive documentation. So if you go to the website, you can click install, or I've got a Raspberry Pi, how do I do this? Or what kind of stuff can I buy to make it work? And it's all right there, and it's really concise, and it's really nice. So it supports the X10 stuff, it supports even stuff that's not really home automation, like it support weather or network stuff, and it can export it to like uh, send you an SMS or just make a web query somewhere else, these sorts of things. Um, so let me see. So now it's time for demo. And so I can just start some take it right here. So you got a question, Matthew? Oh, I was just going to ask if you've heard of Ninja Blocks or the value of Ninja Blocks. Ninja Blocks? I haven't. Could you yeah, just they have a plug in the Raspberry Pi. They sell a bunch of hardware blocks of various kinds that you can just plug together. Uh, raw control via REST API. Uh, but it looks interesting. I haven't actually used it myself. It's one of the things that I've used on that. No, no. There's actually a lot of stuff out there. And like, there was at one point, and now it's kind of went the way of the dodo. But if it's a new thing, then I just haven't heard of it yet. Maybe, yeah. Maybe I can check that out. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, it opened up on the screen over here. So let me move it over here. And so this is kind of the nasty debug view that I did. But like, I can go to devices, and uh, I have my door and my outlet here. 
Um, and so the door is on, and if you just close it a couple of times. Let me turn how to refresh on. So the door is on, and if you close the door, it should turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I wish I had a lamp so I could make you ooh and ah more, but this little LED here, it makes a satisfying clicking sound, so just enjoy the satisfying clicking sound when I can right click. Wait, no. Uh, no. Right clicking's hard, I'm sorry. Uh, Uh, stupid trackpad. If I shoot you with right click, uh, I'm hard. Computers are hard. <laughs> <laughs> you can see where the. Would you like to get all the material? If anyone has a mouse, so I can right click them. <laughs> 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 no, if you're off by, you can hear click. There. Yeah. 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 And, uh... So I see it listing, like, voice messages and calls and emails. <coughs> yeah, it can do a whole bunch of stuff. Like, you can put, like, like you can make a little floor plan graphic, and you can put the device, like, the location of all the little devices on here, and then you can assign little icons to it, so depending on the stage, it'll be on or off. And, uh, yeah, it, it's got timers on it, and you can add things like cron jobs. Uh, you can basically do triggers. Um, <coughs> for this this event. Yeah. Like a zone minder or whatever? Um, it, it actually supports cameras through zone minder if you want to do it that way, but zone minder is more like camera centric. Okay, so this is more general for the, all the devices. That you can do. Exactly, yeah. And so this is just one piece of software that I decided to use, mostly because it was one of the only ones with modern ones that could get over working still. So like this is all of the different standards it supports. So like an SMS room, if you have like a battery backup or something like that. Um, it'll even do like infrared remote controls if you have control it with your TV remote. Um, and yeah, cameras through zone minder. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So you just have this thing running, it's got a little web interface too. Yeah. I've got are you already reusing this tool or something like a control like um like radio fourteen zones or like thermostats for like like a environmental control? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's actually uh, if I can add one here, like I can add a device and there's a bunch of different kinds of devices. So there are thermostats that you can control with these and like depending on certain conditions you can turn it on or off and you can it's not as like set it forget it is the nest, but you can you can do the same stuff with it too. What about um like control of like if you if you were, like, if you were building your own like a uh, microcontroller or something like that, is there like firmware that is it kind of software that you could load on the Mac controller, or do you kind of like build your own? Um, with, it or is... with this, you can have, there's actually plugins for Arduino. So if you want to do something like an Arduino, then you can have plugins for USB, and as a certain kind of module, it works. Cool. Well, it's uh, obviously follow one of the standards too. Yep. Which? I'm thinking of you know all the different applications. There's security. There's monitoring. All those who want to follow. Can you sort of run through what are the big application areas? And is there any newsletter or blog that tracks who's doing what in the space that we can go and use? Okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of people actually do use this for security. So if they don't want to go uh, through a third-party security company to do with their house, they actually uh, buy these same kind of devices and set them up on all of the external points, and then they can have that dial 911 if they want to, or just alert them if something happens. And uh, a lot of the documentation and like blog posts you'll find on the internet are people doing exactly that with it. So especially with cameras and uh, motion sensors. So, um, and as far as like blog posts or blog plans, I'm not sure of any that cover this space in general. Um, if anyone knows one, would be interested. Yeah. So another common use case, now approaching the implementation phase of it is greenhouse automation. Mm -hmm. So the, the obvious trigger is it reaches 90 something degrees, open something, turn on a fan, and obviously so many of these things apply, like logging, charting, API, graphing. Um, and it expands to like moisture sensors uh, for figuring out when the water is low. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's, it's can you get the sensors and can you feed it to the application that you're trying to use? Yeah, exactly. So, the important bit. Uh, and I'm not aware of, of any common resource, but searching these generic terms of what, like automation tends to be a difficult one, but it comes yeah. up with, yeah. Um, yeah, wireless sensors and things like that aren't going to have a very standard way of talking with them. So maybe just raw Zigbee or something like that would be well. Yeah. Okay. So what is preventing you from going to your house and back to where you live? <laughs> Sitting outside your house for twenty minutes and hacking this in or hacking into your little network here and turning on your fireplace repeatedly until things like things in your house. Good guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Not that I would do this, but as a hypothetical question. So Z-Wave is actually one of the very few uh, automation systems that actually underwent penetration testing. And there were some problems with it, and they actually got fixed with some firmware updates to things. That's not to say that it's exactly secure, but with the pairing mechanisms, hopefully you can't spam it to be able to do that. It actually shares uh, There's an actually secure involved. Yeah. But, I mean, if you can get onto my wireless network, then you might be able to get to the control box, in which case you can do whatever you want. Why would that give you my <laughs> With the uh, light switch that you had, it looks like uh, that had a neutral uh, connection that was maybe required for the electronics in it. But, um, some light switches <coughs> take the switch out of the wall. There isn't a neutral, a white wire in the box because it's just a leg that comes down and goes back up to the light in the ceiling. So you have to watch out for that when you're wiring those kind of things. Yep. And guess what? My fireplace does not have that, so it didn't work yet. I'm still trying to figure out yeah. why. And that's exactly you the reason. You have to probably pull another uh, cable to get a neutral wire and uh, two hot and the hot end switch leg there. Uh, another note on the, the X10 thing, if you wanted to find out if you were going to be compatible with from one outlet to another, you could get an extension cord and a voltmeter and take plug the extension cord in and go to the other outlet. And if you get 220 volts between <laughs> the hops, <laughs> then they're on different legs. And if you get zero, then they're on the same leg. Okay, cool. That'd be really useful because I've got like power line Ethernet stuff at home. It's pretty crappy performance. So if I did that, I bet I could find out if they're on the same But also just to see which breakers they're on, if they're on the same side or not. Yeah, but even if they're on even if they're on different breakers, they must still be on the same base. That's true. Okay. Um, going to a screen soon. Oh. <laughs> uh let me see. Do I yeah. So demo time, uh five, yeah. Thank you. This is my information. If you want my slides or anything else, they're up at this address. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what's the best stuff to get started with Raspberry Pis and <laughs> I, I know that there's a ton on YouTube, but, but what do you yeah. think the best like starting path is? Um, so I really like the software I use if you're just starting out with Raspberry Pis in general. Um, I think uh, the Raspberry Pi's website and uh, eLinux is a website that has a bunch of information on getting started with that. Um, when you're comfortable, just like with Raspberry Pi's as a platform, you can then go to the, the website with the software I'm talking about and they can uh, have you go through the step to like write the image to the card and then put it in there. Just, just to clarify, what your setup at home right now is not using? Uh, of Raspberry Pi or are you, are you, using, are you just using the straight up? Yeah, you're I'm using this. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> can you like, outline the differences between the Raspberry Pi and Arduino like, you know, and the like, relative like, advantages and disadvantages? Okay. It's kind of like. Yeah. Um, so with Raspberry Pi, it's just kind of like a small desktop computer. It runs the same software as like a. It, it's Linux. So if you ran Linux on your desktop, it would be running the same software as. <coughs> But with an Arduino, it's much lower powered. Like it, the, the amount of memory on it is measured in kilobytes instead of gigabytes. Um, and so it's very low power, and it can't do a whole lot, and it doesn't really have any built-in way to talk to anything else at all. So it's got no USB, or it barely has USB. It's got no Wi-Fi or anything like that. But is there a Zigbee uh, that you can install it on your Arduino? Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah, so the Arduinos have this uh, little header for a bunch of pins, and they, they, you can buy things called shields that you stick on top of it that give it more abilities like to control a motor 
or to talk about Wi Fi, things like that. Did I miss your question? Cool. So I've actually, uh, I'm insane and love to take projects into the most ridiculous extremes. Uh, I have a caterator, a uh, phone ruler, uh, that you can't just, it's made out of a chest freezer and you can't just put kegs in a chest freezer because they freeze. Mm -hmm. So I pulled off the thermostat and actually I'm using a Raspberry Pi with a, what's called an all mode which is actually an Arduino that is um, able to plug into the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. So he was saying like the Arduino, they're way dumbed down, but what they have that the Raspberry Pi doesn't have is analog digital uh, conversion circuits. Uh, and they're, they're a lot hardier. You can hit them with a lot. Raspberry Pis, they, if you put 5 volts into them, you're, it's done. Uh, or 5 volts into the logic, I should say. Uh, the chips on them only run at 3.3 and they're not taller than 5. But the Arduinos can, <coughs> even if they're running 3.3, they can, you can still hit them with 5 volts and they'll still recognize that. So you can use a lot of different uh, things on them. So I, I just have a temperature controller hooked up to a uh, solid state relay, or a solid state relay and a temperature controller hooked up to Arduino, which is all the mode, which is then hooked up to the Raspberry Pi, which I can then communicate with and uh, use to actually program the Arduino. So it's just keeping your, uh, your freezer exact right temperature? To yeah, the I just keep in my caterator at the right temperature to have beer in the art, since I have an Arduino on it, I, can, I actually have some flow sensors that I'm playing with, so I can actually, someday I will actually be able to pull my keg rigger and say, hey, I'm, I'm here. How much is left in this keg, or how much have people drank, or, you know, we're having a party, uh, and Harry Potter just said the magic word that everyone is supposed to drink. <laughs> because you've got a Raspberry Pi there, you can put like a USB webcam on it and get the alert when you're yeah. at work and see who's drinking the beer mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> I've actually thought about putting like RFID or a fingerprint scanner that you can hook up. It's, uh, hey, but it's awesome. I think you need to make the slides public. Oh. Not get loud. I can't, I can't get to it. You can't get to that mm. Okay. Yeah. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> okay. this. Yeah, I would actually do the same kind of automation setup to brew beer themselves in an automated way. That's which, one of the things. That's my next step. Yeah, that's kind of hardcore because brewing beer is like this many stage process, and it takes a lot of like, mechanical, robotic stuff to be able to do it. Okay. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Another cool project in Raspberry Pi and Arduino. Uh, there's a guy who used. We know to figure out when his cat is pooping in the litter box and the Raspberry Pi tweets it. It's dumb, but it's actually a good idea if you go out of town you can make sure your cat's still eating. <laughs> so, Adafruit is a good vendor that has a lot of information. Of course, they sell a lot of the things that they make, so they have an interest in it. I have no connections to them. But Adafruit tends to be a good place for Arduino and Raspberry Pi products and information. And I think uh, I2C is, is the name of like a line protocol. That's one of the big ones. Yeah, going down that path can get you information about how to make things talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I fully endorse Adafruit and you're a good for information. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.